<laughs> All right, so I'm going to say thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. Again, my name is John Jennings, co-organizer of Actual Blackness 2. Uh, this panel is called the Ethno Surreal and Digital Art. Uh, I'm going to quickly announce our uh, participants. Um, my left, from left arm, we have uh, Dr. Stanford Carpenter, he's an artist, critic, uh, anthropologist, ethnographer, archaeologist. Uh, he's also with the Institute of Comic Studies. Um, let's see, we have uh, Anjali Brown, who is uh, at San Diego State University. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, professor. Okay. Professor. Mm -hmm. um, to his left is also uh, Zio Harris, who is a visual artist and scholar. Hannibal Tabu, who is a comics writer and critic. And, and also, uh, I, just say, I just said author. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 author. Author. Exactly. Yes. And also, last but not least, Clint Fuqua, who is a visual artist. Uh, archivist, scholar, and he's a, a PhD program at Emory University. And so, uh, thank you for joining us, and I can't wait to see you. <coughs> What's your university uh, affiliation? A uh, job? My university? Where am I from? Yeah. University at Buffalo Sun, <laughs> the State University of New York. <laughs> 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 yeah, I just kind of wandered in and started like moderating. <laughs> <laughs> Should be fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. All right, so we're going to start with. Um, Basically, uh, an, uh, an anecdote to a certain degree. Yeah, manifesto. Oh, the, oh, yes, yes, the pre manifesto. All right, pre manifesto. <laughs> so, as far as like the um, ethno surrealism is concerned, our, um, our one of the have put together uh, Musing on an Ethno Surreal Manifesto. Ethno Surrealism uses the notion of the crossroads as a space of comings, goings, meetings, and juxtapositions to engage, one, the multitude of cultural sensibilities, two, myriad theoretical frameworks on equal ground, three, the, the idea of co-presence, simultaneity, hybridity, synchronicity, and discord, four, the emotional or the affective dimension of human experience. At the crossroads, all cultures are equal, all sensibilities have right of way. Ethno surrealism is surrealism that uh, premises cultural or psychoanalytic uh, analytic theory. Hello. Um, so, uh, the whole idea for the ethno surreal emerged um, very much out of conversations between John and I. And um, so we thought we'd start with an anecdote. Um, we're going to be doing a slideshow, and it's going to be on a loop. We're doing it more as a montage. We're not going to be necessarily commenting on, on every slide. We're going to keep this as a, as a conversation, so I'll start with the anecdote, then we're going to go into, into a conversation, and then we're going to leave quite a bit of time for Q&A, because that's what we think is most important. Um, so let me, let, let me start with one of the, with this, is, this is related to one of the early conversations between John and I. Um, in a former <coughs> life, when I, was in, when I was working as an archaeologist in the Caribbean, um, Late at night, we'd sit around and we would drink rum and um, tell stories. And um, the dig director was from Ghana. Um, we had um, several other um, participants in the dig who were from, all of whom were from West Africa. And then we had um, several, several black, black folk from the Caribbean and a couple of African Americans. I mean, it was, a, it, was, it was really interesting because, you know, you had this range of blackness. and. So when it came time to tell this story, things got even more intriguing. Um, Kofi started off with the story, and the story, the story goes that, that long ago there was, you know, or not long ago, there was this man, he was an incredibly friendly man, and he would always walk down the street and say hello to people, he'd stop in traffic and say hello to people, and he was just very friendly. And um, one day he got on the bus, and, and as he's driving along, he kept leaning out the window, and he would say, and he would say hey, and he'd say hello to people, he'd smile to everyone, and the bus driver kept saying, no, stay in the bus, stay in the bus, you know, everyone needs to stay in the bus, stop leaning out the bus. And he was like, no, but I have to say hello to so-and-so, I have to say hello to so-and-so. And then as the bus driver turned the corner, another bus started coming by, and he said, stay in the bus. And he said, no, I have to say, say, I have to say hello to, and the other bus came by and off with his head. And, and, and there was this moment of silence amongst all the people, and the man, tur the man turned to the group, to turn to the group as the head flew off onto the side of the road and got, and um, and dogs surrounded the, the head on the side of the road and he ran and he ran off the bus wiping the blood from his face saying my head my head where's my head and he kept wiping the blood from his face saying my head my head where's my head 
Meanwhile, he got to he felt his way over to over to the side of the road and he picks up a watermelon and that's not it. And then the dog runs around and grabs the head and runs off into the off into the um, off the side of the road into the bushes, and he keeps running around saying, "My head, my head, where's my head?" As he wipes the blood from his face, and. We're all sitting around listening to this story as we're drinking more and more. And, um, and, then, and then, at this moment, one of the other people in the group stopped and said, um, how can he be wiping the blood off his face if his head is on the ground? And then Koga looked at him and said, that's not the point. The point is he's running around wiping the blood off his face, trying to find his head. And then, and then he looked back and he's like, I don't get it. And then all of a sudden, um, Okan, who's from Nigeria, started just laughing. He just started, he just like bust out laughing. He fell off the, 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 the log that he was sitting on laughing. And the black folk from the Caribbean just looked at it with this sense of puzzlement. And myself and the other, and the one, the other African-American male looked at each other with horror, thinking in terms of all these lynching metaphors. And we're like, what is going on here? And, and then Kofi broke in and said, I said, the story's important because if you're sitting, if, you know, if you're ever wandering around and you get separated from the group and you run into the headless man, you need to know that he's friendly and he's just looking for his head, so give him a hand. <laughs> <laughs> and the Africans kept laughing and laughing and laughing. And the African Americans just stood there in horror. And all you could see amongst the people from the Caribbean was this look of the uncanny all around the same story about this friendly guy who loses his head. Meanwhile, I went back to my tent and I was reading a lot of surrealist poetry. I think I was reading Solar Anus at the time. And I started writing notes and creating images in there. And I don't know if you remember the first couple up there. They were all, those were, those were the cartoons that I eventually created based on the headless man. And what it drove home to me was this whole idea that, that, that you know, we're all, you know, there's a, there's a large group of us who are we're black, and we, that yet, yet our cultural experiences, our cultural lenses, you know, and the way we relate to history change. How it is we relate to this story, you know, whether it, whether it be one of, of laughter, puzzlement, or pure horror. And um, the next day as we're walking around, coincidentally, Okan is digging something up, and he pulls up this, um, he pulls up this, the, the, this piece of tree that had fallen off, and actually when he stood it up, it had like, it looked like it had two legs and two arms and no head. And so he put it up at the top of the, at the top of the hill and just mounted it so that we spent the rest, the, the next month <laughs> in the shadow of this like headless man and other stories would come. And then, and then as, the, as the dig moved, as, and over years, the stories would be, more would be added to the story of the headless man in our encounters. Like one where like, oh yeah, I saw the headless man last night, and like, I gave him a parvo, so he poured the drink down his neck, you know, it just, it was just, it just evolved. And that became part of our conversations about this whole idea of, of, you know, of the surreal, but what happens when you take the psychoanalytic out of the surreal, and you start looking at it through these cultural lenses, and you allow for these juxtapositions, and instead of trying to make sense of everything, you allow these different cultural lenses and cultural sensibilities to come together and you, you allow these frameworks to work, you know, different theoretical frameworks to like stand in juxtaposition because the reality is that a lot of the theoretical frameworks are very ethnocentric in, in their construction. So the question became, how do you, it started off with how do you talk about blackness in the new world when there is, when, when if you did a, kinship, a straight up kinship diagram, you would, you know, African Americans, contemporary African Americans, might have, might, might be first, might be first or second cousins to, um, to Afro Caribbeans, and maybe even to, to, to Irish Americans, and and yet to contemporary Africans, they might be more like second or third cousins. And I'm not saying it's absolute, but the relationships are different, and so that's why we wanted to talk about this and allow for hybridity and and talk about it in terms of conversation, um, and that's, that's why we want this to be about conversation, and I've spoken too much. <laughs> yeah. I was going to, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so I teach uh, Africana Studies at uh, San Diego State University, and I had developed the uh, Afrofuturism curriculum for the university, 
and you know, it's been embraced pretty well by the university, right? Um, but my experience in, uh, in developing the curriculum and getting it approved, which took a year, I had, um, the resistance that I felt from my, my department, as well as um, the, uh, the deans of the arts and letters, was uh, in fact a surreal experience. And so since I'm not an art history scholar, per se, um, I had to really think about what I was going to say today with regard to ethno-surrealism. And I said, well, what about our professions and what we do every day as performance art or ethno-surreal performance art, right? So um, my Afrofuturism, 2015 Afrofuturism tour, lecture tour, began with Will Eisner Week. Will Eisner, uh, you know, coined the term graphic novel. And so it began at San Diego State. And um, it, I'm here now, and I'll be at the NCABS conference right one hour after I leave here. And then I hit WonderCon, Comic-Con, and then uh, ending with the World Science Fiction Convention in August, right? And so my experience in creating the class and exposing a predominantly white campus to Afrofuturism for the first time, it's the first semester they've had it on the campus, um, and just understanding the politics of uh, creating a class that can be seen as significant by your college, right? Um, is That's what I'm really gonna talk about as my work as performance art ethno-surrealist performance art. So, but it, all of us can talk about the same thing, right? Um, because some of us are scholars, some of us are artists, some of us are critics and writers. So looking at, in general, black lives as ethno-surrealist performance art, right? Um, our professional barriers, social barriers, and our political barriers, right? Um, I first thought about my presence on the campus, on the predominantly white campus, where you know the most black professors are, of course, working in the African Studies department, and our department is not that big. That's the funny thing. It's like we've got 12 professors. We're very concentrated. There's other professors working in other departments, but we are the most concentrated. Maybe education might have an equal number because there's a good teacher education program at SCSU as well. So our presence is surreal, and whenever our opinions or whenever whenever we uh, assert had the audacity to assert our presence on campus, how that is re reacted to, you know, by others, right? And how we create a surreal experience for them, right? Um, because they're like, oh, okay, you're here, now we have to deal with you, right? And now we have to acknowledge this new blackness, this new astral blackness on our campus, right? Our new way of thinking, because they're so used to us um, teaching what they have already approved, that when we bring something new, they're like, now we have to acknowledge this too, right? And how surreal that experience is. Um, he said, um, talking about the new, bringing new blackness to the, no, bringing blackness to the world. The new world. To the new world. Mm -hmm. well, how about bringing new blackness to an old world, or an right. old world think, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think whenever we assert our intellect, whenever we present on these topics, we are showing and we're you know, expressing um, that we can think alternatively and we're not pigeonholed to one, you know, to one or limit, limited to one box. Um, and I think that in itself uh, creates an experience um, for us because we're seeing how people are reacting to us and so we kind of we bleed off each other. It's like you, if you're doing performance art, it gets... Um, it changes as people react to what you're creating, right? And so, um, as I am uh, doing the tour and talking to students, and people are coming in, and other guests, other professors on campus that kind of are interested in what what I'm talking about, they'll come in and they'll be like, "Wow, we didn't even know you were interested in comics." And I'm one of two professors that teaches comics on the campus. I'm just happy that I'm teaching all black comics. You know, everything from uh, Concrete Park to um, um, the, the milestone comics and Black Panther and stuff like that. I'm gonna change it up, so I'm gonna get kid code on the curriculum. Okay. It uh, me, it's funny. It makes me think of when I was at Johns Hopkins. Um, it, you know, there's almost no black professors on campus, and I was, you know, it was well, it was well meaning. It wasn't done in a condescending way, but I was, but um, this one colleague introduced me to the other, you know, the other black, you know, yeah. black male yeah. teacher, right? <laughs> and so. She, she introduces me to Lester Spence, and, and we look at each other and we're like, I know you from somewhere. And we spent 10 minutes trying to figure out where we knew each other from, and finally we just gave up. And then, um, 
and then we, we scheduled some time to have lunch. And and so before we had the lunch, we we I, I, I had gone over. I went to this local comic shop that I go to, and I walk around the corner and I bumped into him. And we're like, oh my god, that's where we know each other from. We're both go to the same comic shop, so we already had this connection. And I thought it was really interesting how it's like. Like there's all the and then we realized that there are all these other people who are interested in comics. We did we didn't think like we had a dean who had original comic art up on up on one of his walls, and we nobody knew it, you know. And, and like you're talking about like feeling alone, like like being interested in comic art. And I'm wondering if 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 you, if if you would if you might not find eventually that there might be a lot of other people who are interested in comics, but they don't teach comics. Um, real quick, just to add on to that, um, the co-presence of being um, kind of like a new age black intellectual and trying to fit in on a predominantly white campus is very interesting. And I'm not going to hog the mic because I, I know my panelists have so much to say. So that is, my, that is what I'm bringing to this is the performance piece of ethno-surrealism from a scholar's perspective. Well, I guess I bring the visual artist perspective. My name is Zeal Harris, and I've exhibited throughout Los Angeles and around the country here and there. And um, most recently, I was in an exhibit um, at Pomona College, curated by um, Dr. Valerie Thomas, and it was called Vertigo at Midnight, Afrofuturisms and Speculative Migrations. And um, I am... I am very interested in this topic of ethno-surrealism and how my work relates to that as a visual artist. The first time I heard the term was from Stanford and he said he was having conversations with John about this and that they were talking about Afro-surrealism and they were talking about, well, how do we teach this for our students in a multicultural classroom? So, you know, what happens when we, you know, go from Afro-surrealism to ethno-surrealism and what are the, what, what kind of conversations, what kind of questions are created out of that? For me as a visual artist on this panel, it becomes what does the artwork look like and who gets to qualify as ethno-surrealist? I mean, first of all, we do have to define it. And so that is part of what's happening today, that they're defining a new term, a new academic term that we can use, um, we can create a new discourse, a lens to look at a lot of different work and it doesn't have to just be post-colonial, it can reference all of art history. And so, um, so what I did was I created a Pinterest board of some images, many of which are in this slideshow. Well, not many, many, but actually there's probably like 75 to 100 images on the Pinterest board, including book titles and one very interesting um, reference that if anyone's very interested in this topic, there's a journal called um, the Journal of Surrealism in the Americas, and they accept essays for any topic on surrealism from you know the beginning of the I guess uh, European settling of this era, or prior to that up until now. So um, again, for me, you know, ethno surrealism is a heavy academic term that has a lot of unpacking to do in it, and hopefully we'll do that in this panel. Well, I'm Hannibal Tabu, and my first question is why we all have to share this mic while Stanford has one. Uh, that was the first thing that I'm looking at. Damn. I'm just, I'm just going to ask that question and put that out there. It's going to be that kind of battle. When the Nord moved too far, because uh, I also am very upset with Microsoft because we have to manually advance the slideshow, and I've been doing that this whole time, and uh, Bill Gates can go to hell. Uh, but, uh, Shouldn't you be freeing Wakanda right now? <laughs> am I not freeing Wakanda right now? Am I not? But <laughs> in any case, uh, I come at the subject from a slightly different uh, perspective as a journalist and as uh, a real a person who works really in comics is their prime, predominant milieu. I've written a column called The Bipow, a review column at Comic Book Resources for about 10 years, and I did it some other places that I don't remember, uh, about <laughs> four or five years before that. Um, so on a weekly basis, I'm reading 70 to 80 comic books and reviewing them and talking about them uh, every week, you know, for what feels like forever now. Uh, and in doing so, I've really had to absorb a lot of different aesthetics and a lot of different ideas. So the first thing, when I was looking at the definition of ethno-surrealism, talking about uh, that it has a multitude of cultural sensibilities, and myriad theoretical frameworks, co-presence, simultaneity, hybridity, I'm like, so it's hip-hop. Yeah. That's what I'm hearing. I mean, because, you know, basically you're saying you're going to take the ethnocentric, almost European ideal of surrealism, hook a beat up and turn it into hip-hop form. I can do that, I understand that, that makes sense to me. 
Uh, so I was immediately calling shenanigans on, on the titling of it uh, in that regard because they were like, no, it's not Afro-surrealism, it's ethno-surrealism. I'm like, so it's for Vikings and people from Iceland too? I mean, what? <laughs> so these were questions that I was asking while I was looking at it. And, and overall, I approach it from the same way that, you know, the, that hip-hop is the same as what Chuck Berry was doing, is the same as the griot tradition, is the same all the way back to the continent. It's all one continuous condition. Uh, the twitchiness of how it's named and the specific sophistries in that regard don't always apply to me. I'm like blah 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 blah. But uh, <laughs> in looking at the the shift in the mundane and finding more fantastic things in it, like magical realism, like um, some of the images that you're seeing on the screen right now, that's where I really live because I've never accepted this reality as enough. And in the traditions of uh, African people, they would say a word, like in uh, the ancient language of the Egyptians, met in a chair, there's a word called djed, D-J-E-D, and it means tree, it means father, it means stability, it means all these things at the same time, right. and they have no problem understanding that because it's based on context, it's based on who's saying it, it's based on who's hearing it. That kind of uh, simultaneous existence for things is very common for people of color around the world but it doesn't fit into the traditional, as he said, psychoanalytical look at surrealism because they have to follow a specific cultural framework. And as he said, with ethno-surrealism, or hip-hop as I'm gonna call it, um, <laughs> everybody stands on even ground. Everybody's got a mic, everybody's got a mixer. Go for yours. All right, sounds good. Yeah. Okay, so uh, there's a few things that have gone on thus far that I'm curious about and the first thing that I'm thinking about is why we so often uh, have the need to define these movements um, so for example we're talking about the ethno surreal I am a professor I'm also a student at Emory University and I too teach a class on Afrofuturism and the first thing that I talk to the students about is all right so y'all notice we got Afro in front of futurism let's have a conversation about that um, when we're talking about ethno surreal on this panel I think about the early 20th century, I think about surrealism, I think about the black surrealists, mm -hmm. I think about Amir Baraka then coming up with, what was it, uh, Afro-expressionist surrealism, I yep. think about uh, D. Scott Miller coming back with Afro-surrealism and the branching off of Afro-futurism, and now I hear ethno-surrealism. And I'm curious, uh, as a scholar... <laughs> that wasn't awkward at all. <laughs> Don't worry, we didn't see you, brother. <laughs> He's not big in time. He's not invisible. Come on. You're the invisible man. <laughs> um, I'm curious, as a scholar, um, if this is a debate that I have with myself. If often I'm spending too much energy in the world of defining and not doing enough of what we were talking about earlier, of performing and doing the work. Mm -hmm. And so as a uh, visual artist, some of my slides, actually, oh, that's one right there. Um, I'm an origami artist, and uh, most of these uh, images are coming from work that I did between 2009 and 2012. And I was traveling through Europe and through Asia, and I was having like this kind of spiritual awakening. You know what I'm talking about. And then, uh, I was also thinking about my own value as a person. Um, and this is a really important thing for black people, especially today with Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I came up with a storyline that I wanted to tell, and I realized I couldn't, I couldn't write that narrative. I'm, I'm a visual artist, so I started sketching it out first. And that narrative was about a, uh, a, a young man named Tom Sterling who was actually a god but didn't realize it. He had forgotten. Hmm. And he was going through the world, and until he realizes his own, his own value, realizes that he's a god, the world is in peril and it will end. Hmm. And he I gets reincarnated over and over into the world as different people, <coughs> different genders, um, different things, until eventually he realizes that he's a god. And I tell these chapters in the storyline on the origami, um, and it's all jumbled up together, and basically each origami structure is a chapter. Now, that's all really cool, right? So I was traveling around, and then I came back to Atlanta, and I entered this PhD program and started studying people like me, and I realized that <laughs> since, since that point, I haven't made any origami. <laughs> I'm like, 
damn, I gotta, I gotta get back to the work. And what I've, what I've learned when I think about the ethno surreal is that there's this world of dreams, this world of the imaginary. It is incredibly important because when we think of the artists who create this work, coming up with creative solutions in this world, we have to find a way to bridge that into the lived world, the lived experience. And so the medium that I found is I started an art salon last year. And I'm, what I'm working on right now is getting um, black uh, professionals, young black professionals in the public and private sector, not just black people, just black people come to my school. <laughs> <laughs> I want everybody to come. That's you know? right. <laughs> hey, man, in Atlanta, you never know. People start seeing that. All right. So. <laughs> uh, but I, I've tried to get um, young professionals especially to come and spend time with artists and learn and so they can learn from each other because together at that crossroads where everyone meets that's when we come up with creative solutions to the problems that really uh, are permeating throughout society and I think that too often I think it was Juno Diaz I was looking at a talk he gave recently he was like artists speak to the silence that's happening in society right and if you're looking at a presidential campaign and you're just sort of seeing what's happening. They, the, the people rarely talk about artists. They never mention an artist, unless it's Paul Lauren, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that if we can't find a way to, to merge these sectors together, we really are at peril. It's important. The creative solution is often a great solution. So that's what I have to contribute to this. Right? Like with a mixer? Mix them all together? Yeah, it's hip hop, baby. <laughs> that's two out of five. I'm working on it. <laughs> Well, I think what's, what's interesting about you know the, the dilemma that you raise when you talk about the obsession with naming is <clears throat> that um, you know I would almost say, well, well, here's the thing: if 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 you don't claim a name for yourself, someone will name you. Yeah. True. Yeah. And so, and and that naming does. I mean, and, and you go across cultures, you know, European, African, Asian, like the power of you know, naming is. Is all about power. In fact, that's modernity is a, is a lot about naming and categorizing and the power that comes from it. So, so when you when you do affirmatively take on a name and assert it, that is a that 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 is a moment where you are where you're. You could call it a power grab. You could call it self determination. Well, I would call it self-determination, except in certain applications where people are applying the term, oh, this is surrealist, oh, this is not. Who are you to say? What, did the art, what was the artist's intention? You know, because, I mean, whether, and I've said, you know, I've said this throughout my career, whether I was writing a novel, whether I was writing journalism, whether I was reviewing something, whether I was hosting karaoke, it was all hip-hop, because that's who I am, and that's that, my self-identity, um, under even the Nguzo Saba, the, the principles, that is my Kuchi Shadli, that is my self-determination. So if somebody ends up saying, oh, wow, there's surrealist touches to this, that's great, but that's them either appropriating or labeling me. That's not the name I put on uh, That you know, Chuck Berry wasn't saying, I'm going to found rock and roll. He was like, I'm going to go out and play this soul music that people like. You know, but all of a sudden, oh, no, that's not soul music anymore. Now it's rock and roll. I'm sorry, what? That's not what I said. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to say that I have one of those um, really um, goosebump moments when I was um, going back and reading the essay, the original essay that um, Amiri Baraka wrote, mm -hmm. where he coins the term Afro-surreal, and <laughs> finding out yeah, yeah, and that yeah. Henry Dumas was actually um, <coughs> shot by a police officer in a case of mistaken identity on the subway train. Mm -hmm. So we talk about surreal and Afro-surreal, and then we bring that to ethno-surreal, and we update that today to Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's it's something that's really ironic and kind of mind chilling to me. You know, I'm gonna, wasn't he coming from a Sun Rock concert? He was. He I'm was. not sure. Yeah, I think he was coming from a Sun Rock concert oh. like after he got shot. I mean, yeah. you know, before he got shot. Yeah. Talk about that, you know, it's back, too. Yeah. Anyway, keep it sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a moderate. I know. <laughs> <laughs> what, what? I'm a moderate moderator. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, did you want to add something to you? Um, I guess, um, I think bouncing off of what Hannibal said about what we create, creates an experience for someone else, and that experience bounces back to us, the creator. And it's that uh, symbiosis, is that the right word? Symbiosis mm -hmm. that happens that is the surreal experience, you know, and it's very, 
as an academic, I, I live by definitions. I have to. My students have to know exactly what I'm talking about, and I have to give them, but I have to give them a context and what I'm talking and, and the way I'm talking about it. So, um, but at the same time, when you define something, it also kind of limits it too. Yeah. And so, yeah. being here, you know, and, and we got to understand we have to we can accept the de definition, but loosely, and uh, grow from that and be able to accept the, something as not it's either or, but it's both and. Mm -hmm. right. Tell it. and. And speaking of that, for me, um, the value of um, a term like ethno-surrealism is that we can still have Afro-surrealism and we can also have ethno-surrealism. And for me, the value is, it, is in the people of color consciousness that it signifies by putting that word there. Because, um, you know, I, I'll just use my own work as an example. Um, right now, I have some work that maybe about black people going to other cultures and having experience and illustrates that. And so then, you know, I can, that could be looked at under the lens of Afro-surreal and it could also be looked at as ethno-surreal. And then I'm in dialogue in some artwork with the, an Indian playwright, an East Indian playwright, and none of the characters in the narratives are actually African-American. Mm -hmm. And so I'm dealing with international issues that I feel are of significance mm -hmm. to the international community. And at the same time, you know, um, it's nice to have a word like ethno surrealism to unpack the work as well. It's 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 nice to have, but in, to back up on what Clint was saying, it's also the fact that you're actually doing the work. You're right. defining it as you go. You're accepting the definitions and, and making those definitions in that regard. One of the things I quote a lot. There was a book by Warren Ellis called Transmetropolitan, mm. where um, he had uh, this this writer talking to his assistant saying. That's the problem with you. You go to journalism school, you try to focus on learning and this focus. You don't learn journalism by going to class. You learn journalism by doing effing journalism. You get out, you tell the stories, you make mistakes, and you learn from them. And that's what, I mean, Spirit knows I've made my share of mistakes, but uh, it, I've, I've learned more by doing professionally than I did in my academic realm. That the writing I did as a Calo College student was nothing compared to the writing I did, you know, trying to understand labor disputes between, you know, unions and and uh, a, a contractor. So that sort of thing taught me much more than I could in certain academic settings, which is, you know, and I have all due respect to all the academic things, but sometimes I'm like blah 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 blah, I cut to the chase. Yeah, but I mean, and this this comes back to, um, I mean, two points. One is that there's. There's multiple ways of, of learning. There's also multiple ways of conversing and developing ideas. When John and I were, were first talking about ethno-surrealism, I mean, some of it were just, were like, just, you know, were jokes. Like, like, like one time I, I made some offhanded comment about, you know, we're talking about Afro-surrealism. We I was like, I was like, damn, John, you shouldn't have to grow. You shouldn't have to grow hair to join a movement, you know. And uh, <laughs> you know, um, and so, <laughs> you know, but. But then, but then we started, you know, like, like I have my Headless Man pieces, but he has a series of Headless Man pieces. There's a whole side of our conversation about the ethno surreal that is based upon us making and exchanging art between one another. Mm -hmm. And that we don't, we don't limit ourselves just to that. The thing is that this format emphasizes, you know, this very kind of, you know, and, and we're trying to break a little bit with the format and what we're doing, but this format leans itself towards definitions Talking, talking, you know, talking at people, um, and and th that can be kind of rough. But then I would also say, you know, harken back to our conversation when we were in the car earlier, when you were talking about being a journalist, and I was contrasting that with being an anthropologist, mm -hmm. and about as a journalist, like 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 you cut, di you have a different different relationship to the people you're writing about, and I as an anthropologist also have a different relationship to the people who I write about. I picked anthropology to be honest because. I like having relationships with people more than I do with books. And anthropology emphasizes... And I'm a misanthrope, so I can't say. And, and, and anthrop <laughs> anthropology emphasizes going out and being with people. So we agree on that. We just have different ways of getting that. Absolutely. Okay, forgive me. So we have a couple more minutes and then Yeah, so again, I'm just, again, thinking about the uh, dilemma that we face in settings like this and also in... Uh, well, I mean, we're out on a campus, but like in the classroom setting and as academics trying to talk about something like ethno-surrealism, like Afrofuturism, and I bring up Afrofuturism just because I know more about it. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, so I'll stick to that. Uh, but uh, when teaching this kind of work to students, and at Emory it's predominantly white and Asian, and then there are some black students there too. I think I have one black student in my class out of 20, and I was like, ah, come on. 
<laughs> um, basically, uh, what, what I face as a challenge is trying to inform people about this world of the black imaginary, about this world of Afrofuturism. But then I also have to consider the fact that now that Afrofuturism is a term with history, That's right. and all of the uh, major heavyweights that I was reading, um, some of which are here today, are now teaching this in school as well, at what point does it become too formulaic yeah. for the mm. students, okay. right? Um, to be able to interpret what it is that I'm saying, to question what it is that I'm saying about this world. You don't want it to become something where suddenly it's just, oh, okay, that's Afrofuturism, black people in space with spears, awesome. Got it. Right? Because that's, that's where people go. I've seen it happen every time. They're like, I got it. Sun Ra, George Clinton, Janelle Monet, oh yeah. You know, it's like, no. we, 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 have to, we have to keep pushing this thing um, so that it comes back on itself, right? When I tell them to write essays, I'm like, look, give me some framework, you know, give me some examples, but then ask yourself questions about what you just said. Because that's the only way that we keep moving things and keeping it marginal. In the marginal, that's where I think we have some real, um, uh, 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 the ability to subvert uh, the power structures. Yeah. Keep, re re keep redefining the experience, basically. Oh. So, so um, on that note, we're going to open it up. Um, first question is going to go to Dr. Nama. So I'm going to use my privileges as a coach. Yeah, yeah, he, he, yeah. That's mm -hmm. right. <laughs> so, um, coach, uh, I was going to say cons conspire, uh, but uh, <laughs> organized, I guess. Uh, so, uh, listen, first of all, let me say this in preface that uh, I say this question in the spirit of Don Williams, <coughs> with love, peace, and soul. Uh, and nonetheless, I'm going to uh, really advocate the hard line. So someone's, someone's going to have to uh, advocate a hard line here. And, uh, and this is my position. I, I think ethno surreal is a generic. I think ethno surreal is a methodology. I think ethno surreal uh, mystifies more than it um, uh, clarifies. I think Afro surrealism, that is Afro, Afro American, Afro um, Latino, Afro, the Afro of the, of the definition gives us the, uh, communicates what in fact we are looking for. <coughs> it, gives us a, it gives us an orientation. It uh, uh, locates us in a historical uh, discourse. Uh, when we move away from Afro, Surrealism, we move away from Baraka. We move away from, uh, from Baraka and notions of the black Dadaism. Uh, that, that's lost in this kind of like generic uh, notion of ethnicity. So I'm, I'm more concerned about, I want to know what ethnicity are we talking about. Are we talking about Jamaican? Are we talking about uh, African American? Are we talking about uh, Ecuadorian or Panamanian? I need to know who is saying what so I can understand what is being said. I agree with you in this regard, in that uh, the first thing I thought was, I was like, ethno, so we're saying it's okay for Visigoths to have, you know, because ethno means culture, and that could be anybody, you know, that could be Martians, that could be, you know, fraggles for all I know, but uh, the point, <laughs> didn't expect me to go with that, uh, <laughs> but, uh, which is why I immediately tossed the table over and said it was all hip-hop and called it a day. Um, but in that regard, the idea when we were talking about the definite, the musings, as Stanford was saying, uh, were that this is a meta concept, that it stands as a theoretical concept over which uh, Latino surrealism, Afro surrealism, and such, such and so forth would live under that umbrella. Now, do I 100% agree with it? No, because I'm going to put hip hop on top of all that anyway. <laughs> but that was what we discussed initially. So. And I talked to D. Scott Miller um, last week, and he's the person who wrote the Afro-Surrealist Manifesto that we're referring to, and, uh, the recent one. Um, and, you know, he was taking that position also that Afro already has in that Afro-Asiatic, which covers people of color. But I think that, you know, um, in everyday language, in the vernacular, the layman's usage or the layperson's usage, Afro does mean black as opposed to Afro-Asiatic. And so, you know, in post-colonial, post-modern, uh, the controversial, controversial era of post-black, <laughs> that ethno is the is the contemporized way of saying Afro-Asiatic. I don't like it. <laughs> I, have a, I have a question. What about 
in a sense, though, I feel like the ethno surrealism it sort of legitimizes that space for ambiguity for those that don't have a strictly defined Jamaican surrealism or even these intersections of our ethnicities that sort of define the surrealist experience. The surrealistic experience. So. And that was very much a part of a part of the discussions that's emerged out of is that when you start, you know, what is the black experience and like what you just said about ambiguity. Um, I think that that is important, and I think what is important is also to capture so that, you know, these affective dimensions, to, to explore the ambiguity, to explore the hybridity, and to, and to also look at, like, hey, yeah, you said Visigoths? Yes, Visigoths also interact with black folk, too. Well, we'll and so, you know, or, you know, but, you know but, 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 but the point, the point is, that, is, that, is that culture shifts and changes even, 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 the, I, even, if you look at the way people talk about race um, before the civil rights movement and after the civil rights movement, I mean, it, it the, before the civil rights movement, it maps more onto the way we currently talk about ethnicity. Afterwards, it becomes much more tied to the visual, and so that was part of that was part of the anxiety that kind of that created these conversations of how do you bring these differences together without premising one thing over another, and when, and especially with something like surrealism. Even though the surrealists took from a lot of different <coughs> cultures, in the end, when you once once you once you impregnate it with psychoanalytic theory, at that point it becomes Eurocentric in its in its orientation. And there are so many other cultures out there for which the conscious and the unconscious are not are are, are not are not this are not central. And and so if you just go with Surrealists, you run into that, you know, you, you, you have to deal with that psychoanalytic baggage and you have to, you have to almost convert, you have to convert the culture, whatever, you have to, do, you convert whatever it is you're talking about so that it fits with sort of the psychoanalytic, with the psychoanalytic theory that works perfectly fine for European cultures, but not so much for other cultures. And so you get all of these translations that happen as opposed to creating a space where you can have just, whether it's juxtaposition, simultaneity, or discord. Let it happen. Mm. I, have, I have actually a question that uh, just popped in my head. Eurocentric because of the language that is, it is discussed in, or Eurocentric. In the language it's discussed in, and yeah. also, and also in terms of the culture it's coming out of. If you look at the look at the relation, look at look at the relation. Look, okay, psychology is a. I'm not saying it's like that, there, that. There's something inherently wrong with psychology, but the whole idea of psychology is very. It's, it's very Western. Is this idea that, like, you know, um, I, I remember seeing this Law and Order episode where they're where they're, <laughs> inter they're interviewing this person about, you know, about his about her relationship to this guy, and and she said we're friends, and they're like, are you sure you're friends? You know, and you're like, well, yeah, we meet here, and we and we talk about our problems, so you're more than friends. She's like, no, we meet at the bar and we talk and we have when we're friends. You know, it's kind of like it's kind of like therapy for poor people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and so and, and that's that moment where you where where you, you start to realize that like 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 that psychology emerges out of its, it it does emerge out of a, a, a set of cultural milieus that aren't necessarily applicable to that, that aren't universal. Well, I want to say in ethno surrealism, we we really do have to deal with the word surrealism and. And originally, the original surrealists were French, and they based their manifesto on writings by Freud. Mm. So it was based on empirical psychological theory. Mm. Uh, and so when we think about what the artists were actually doing, though, is they were responding to 500 years of realism. Mm. And they were also living in a time where World War I had just ended. Mm. And they were trying to break down boundaries of nations, definitions of nation. They were anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, and they were dealing with what they felt were a few people who were benefiting with all this wealth from the slave trade and from imperialism and colonialism. And so then they were also seeing all these art and these objects coming from other places. And they were like, wow, where is this stuff coming from? How can they make it? How come I'm responding to it in this way, but it's not realism? Wow, it must be under realism, surrealism, you know? So they come up with this new word. What is that thing that's underneath it that makes us create art and has this magic over people? And so, again, they did their best, I think, they, I'm going to give them some benefit of the doubt, they did their best to try and incorporate um, these new ideas 
and respond to them. Even when they had their international exhibits as surrealists, they would often try to explain hundreds of objects uh, and art artifacts and, 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 and things that were made outside of Europe all around the world beside their paintings, mixed in, high level, low level, without, without hierarchy. So it's pretty interesting when you look at it from that point of view. They also didn't embrace any specific way of making the art. And so again, we come back to, hmm, this is a, an artistic discourse that didn't have a way that you were supposed to make the art, like a way that it was supposed to look. So when you actually look at the diversity of art making in those artists, it's pretty surprising, although now we think of somebody like Salvador Dali mm -hmm. as being what surrealism is, but it, it I'm going too long. No, 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 oh. oh, he was right behind. <laughs> that was ironic. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> well, <laughs> and so, so that's what I was saying. But the fact that it was based on this sort of like psychological theory is one of the things that may be what we can look at as a flaw that makes it Eurocentric. Uh -huh. or yeah, as opposed to as being as um, as open as they wanted to embrace, but that was their way of approaching. Well, how do we get to that 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 thing that all humans share, that sacred, beautiful thing? I just yeah, I just I just wanted to say uh, so. This again, like the the naming of things, though important, is still a very challenging. Uh, process. So we're talking about ethno-surrealism, and we just finished describing how ethno-surrealism uh, deals with, what are you calling it, cultural theory, um, as opposed to um, psychoanalytic theory. But I think that things still bleed together, like they still uh, you know, mix and match. And so I'm wondering what the value is in keeping the surrealist name and then adding ethno on top when... Um, Artists just make art, right? You know, it's like artists do what they do, and then we come back later, and then we're like, so this is it, right? So this, this is this is what I've been saying about Sun Ra and all the all the like for the uh, for the classes. I'm like, all right, so they have their own thing that they. This is what we do, right? We're talking about astro blackness. We talk about the space core. You know, we, when we go when we go to um, when we go to George Clinton, and then we talk about the funk, right? Like it's the funk. It's not Afrofuturism. It's the funk. That's what they want to call it. That's right. True. And <laughs> <laughs> all right, Dr. Fuck right. sitting right there. And I think it's it's fine to go back and to 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 try and name some of these things. But I mean, actually, I was at a at a uh, conference a while ago, and George Clinton was there, right? Mm -hmm. And they were sitting there talking to him, and be like, "So, what do you think about Afrofuturism?" And he was like, "It's cool. I'm gonna sell I'm gonna sell some books, right?" <laughs> 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 I mean, <Yeah. laughs> I'm paraphrasing. Um, but he was like, yeah, "It's cool. I do that. I do that." You know, that's what I do. And I'm like, "That's exactly. It's like people do what they do, and then we come back to it, and we we put these names on it. And sometimes I think these." It does a disservice to how they kind of mix together and blend together, and we have to be cognizant of that because some people are cool with just the, the term surrealism, right? And it's like I just yeah. do it my way. And it's, like, oh. it's, all, it's, it's not always about imposing a name either. I mean, it, it's. I mean, it comes back to what we were talking about yesterday in terms of comics. Like, what are comics? Are they, you know, you know, this debate about like comics being pop art, and then I, I, I and I made that comment that that I felt like comics are basically, even though the people who made comics, they were not trying to, they were not trying to engage surrealism. Mm -hmm. But when you, if you look at comics as a form, it is, it, it, it is inherently surreal. And it, and it, in, in that, it, it provides for a certain level of simultaneity. Mm -hmm. You see the, you, you know, the fact that you have word balloons and thought balloons, mm -hmm. and you can have word balloons and thought balloons with pictures in them, means that you have simultaneity, you have multiple levels of experience and consciousness all being experienced at the same time. Now, were, the, were comic book creators surrealists? No. But you could, but the argument can be made that what they did really tapped into surrealist sensibilities. And so I think there's a difference between going back and saying, well, so-and-so is a surrealist, and so-and-so is tapping into these these sensibilities. And, I, and that's also what we... That, that's also what we try to do with the idea of ethno surrealism in terms of like how is it that you tap into or create a space and where we talk about the crossroads, you know, how is it that you, you create the space so that you can talk about the sensibilities that emerge out of these different theories, these different lenses, these different cultures, without having to like immediately first translate them into some sort of lingua franca. Mm -hmm.
The Reverend's been really okay. patient. You know, um, <laughs> let me uh, make a quick statement for about 30 seconds, and I got a quick question which dovetails into it. You know, okay, when you look at political movements, mm -hmm. politics is about doing politics. But political movements generally also have terms and definitions, and they evolve. And so if we're looking at this, you're looking at you as artists or criti uh, critics of art, and we're talking about an artistic movement. Just what is, I mean, I want to leave here with a. <laughs> Because <laughs> I've, I've got I got a panel of experts here, and I, the Reverend wants to leave here with a definition of ethno surrealism, and then I would like to also know how is that different from Afro surrealism. And how does that relate to Afrofuturism? Now help me. I have, I have simple, I have, you, you go first, I have several thoughts. Uh, it's all organic, it's all growing. Those definitions will change day to day. Like we'll give you a definition today and then tomorrow. Well, we'll give me one today. Give me one today. <laughs> If I'm teaching Bible, oh, my, 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 my parishioners won't let me get away with that. The, Reverend, okay. give me one today. Then I have a definition for you today. Okay. okay. Ethno surrealism is intended. It's it's uh, uh, intended for people, cultures. So white folk could do it, Latino people could do it. Yada. Afro surrealism is specific to a African descendant experience, being one of the diaspora. Be you, you know, uh, uh, the Maroon people. Be you in Zimbabwe. Be you Aboriginal from uh, uh, Australia. Whatever that experience uh, falls upon uh, under that. Uh, all of it is as noted by the prefixes. Brands of surrealism. This kind of you know thought of something different than what reality is. And again, at the top, I'm gonna say it's all hip hop because people are making their own decisions about things. I'm gonna run that play nonstop. That's the offense I'm doing. So uh, in, this, in this stretch, it's basically a way of framing certain works to help them be done. However, uh, I will frame that with another story. I used to, my ex-wife used to be related to the singer Phil Perry who was a, a R&B singer in the 90s, he was yeah. super popular. Yeah. Yeah. And his wife was talking to us about, we can't list him as an R&B artist anymore because they expect him to be young and have his pants sagging and to be singing about smacking people or something. Uh, that's not the sort of music he wants to do. So we have to now list him as smooth jazz and that's how he gets built. Is the music he's doing any different? Nope. Is the approach he's doing to things any different? Nope. But the name that he puts on it to be able to make money? That had to change. And that's, that's a factor of business, not about factors. So in the way that you say what you teach in the Bible re remains consistent no matter what happens to you, I'm going to say that this is hip-hop, whether this is today, whether this is 20 years from now, and they're changing the definition or whatever. It's still going to be hip-hop, because I'm going to hook it up to a mixer, and I'm going to be able to butcher, butcher, butcher. So <laughs> that's what I'm saying to it. There are different opinions on this panel. I would agree with all those opinions on this panel. I want to hear everybody, so I take some home with me. So I, I have actually set up, set up a Pinterest board that has like um, some examples of some of the most popular work by the original French Surrealist. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested, you can go to that Pinterest board. It's called Ethno Surrealism. It's the only one on Pinterest that's <laughs> called that. <laughs> it has 75 to 100 images on it, and it also has some other work that I'm looking at that um, we can propose to be under the realm of Afro ethno surrealism. Um, I want to say that surrealist work um, basically tried to look at reality and respond to realism in a certain way by making it not real. And like we said before, manifest dream images and these psychological images in their work when it was narrative. But they also did object making as well. And so because they didn't have a very specific look, it becomes more difficult to tell you what surrealism looks like when it's a picture, when it's visual art, okay? In popular, popular surrealism, that still continues. I would say artists like Mark Ryden 
um, today would be a really good example of what um, pop surrealism looks like for some people. Um, and in, uh, if you want to say Afro surrealism, you might want to say somebody like Kahende Wiley. That would be an example of surrealist portraiture. And you could look at that and kind of get a sense. You look at this work and it's reality, but it's not really reality. It's sort of, you know, mystical maybe. Um, it's taking in some of the everyday and the vernacular, and it's twisting things and making it look fantastic. Now, I understand surrealism, but how is ethno surrealism different from Afro surrealism? What is the difference? Thank you. I'm going to let somebody else answer that question. I was going to answer one that you asked also, which okay, was what is its relationship to, to Afrofuturism? Afro yeah, both, yeah, those are the two things I'm trying to, I want to come to. I think so. Okay. It's not about how it looks. <laughs> it's not about that it's going to have a consistent look, but it's more about where the artist positions themselves when they make the work and how other people who are academic can use the term to talk about their work. As so, a discourse. So, so an, an ethno surrealist would position himself where, and an Afro surrealist would position himself where. They could be in the same place at the same time and be the same person. Oh. Or one could be in Brentwood and be a white person, and one could be in Compton and be a black person. And that's what. I just didn't take me some. I just didn't take me some LSD. Well, actually, um, Reverend. Take me some LSD and go on a trip. <laughs> Can I just say this real quick? Okay. So, again, the relationship to Afrofuturism. Yeah. Um, so, when we're talking about like Afro surrealism, yeah. this is something that D. Scott Miller re coined because we were talking about how Mary Baraka yeah. also coined this term because of Afrofuturism. He was sitting here looking at Afrofuturism on Afrofuturism.net, and this has become like the overarching term for right. black speculative. Right. Right? And a lot of it is yeah. tech heavy. Yeah. Okay. And a lot of it is dealing with the future and the past. And D. Scott Miller wanted to deal with the present. He wanted to deal with the now. Mm -hmm. And he also didn't think that Afrofuturism as a term was black enough. Mm -hmm. The reason he didn't think it was black enough was because Mark Derry, who was a British scholar, came up with the name. Right? Which is why we have all this going back and forth about the name. And I think that it's an interesting debate. I, I don't know where we should land on that. <laughs> but it's an important thing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to do this. But uh, again, um, this is something about I was talking about. This is a general discussion about a lot of like um, uh, pieces that are being put in place to, to, to a certain degree to do what you're doing is kind of challenge some of these, uh, in these different spaces. Okay. So um, I'm sorry to have to shut it down. But we're going to come continue this uh, conversation. Over dinner and drinks. Oh, yeah. yeah. oh you pay in? Let's do this. Come on. Yeah. So thank you very much for your wonderful panel. <laughs>